so what I wanted to do today here was just give some kind of general, uh, I would say, theming and uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 thematic um, comments about the physics project and the metamathematics project and how I see them evolving right now and what I see as being sort of the key uh, directions that uh, can be taken at this, at this point in these projects. So, I mean, this is kind of a super exciting time. You know, I think as somebody who's watched the history of lots of kinds of science over the course of, uh, well, now about five decades, um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see there's a certain rhythm that things seem to follow, which is that some new idea methodology gets invented and suddenly lots of stuff opens up and there's this wonderful period of five, 10, maybe 20 years where there's just a lot of low hanging fruit to be picked. And then things get a bit harder and it maybe takes a century or so before you get to the next moment where there's lots of low hanging fruit to be picked. Um, we are at one of those moments where there is low hanging fruit to be picked. There's a bunch of new ideas, new methods, and uh, it's kind of exciting. I really didn't expect this to happen. Um, I didn't think, you know, it was not obvious it was a this century kind of activity. But uh, we've been really lucky that uh, this is this we seem to have kind of um, hit something that is just extremely fertile and extremely fertile both for physics and now we realize for mathematics and the same kinds of methodologies we think are going to apply to lots of other fields and we've started exploring that uh, pretty much under the banner of multi computation. But um, so you know, it's, it's always interesting to see, I, I have to say, as sort of a student of the history of science and the sociology of, of science, um, there's this wonderful thing that happens when sort of new fields open up, which is both there's a, there's a set of people who entrepreneurially choose to be involved with those new fields, and those people tend to be very productive, but there's also the field itself allows for high productivity. And the combination of those two things makes for just a really terrific time in, in these particular stages in, in the opening of fields. So the other thing I say, would say has happened with the physics project is I had been thinking about things that were sort of the precursors of this project from the early 1990s onward. I had kind of stopped for quite a while um, after the NKS book came out and so on. Um, and the thing that is kind of like, well, I think it's going to work this way. And I think it's all going to fit together like this. And the thing that I think has been just amazing is to see that, yes, it really, all these pieces really do seem to fit together. It, it's not like, you know, when people say, is this, is this theory right? Um, at this point, it's beginning to feel like, look, there's no choice. This has to be the way it works. There's a huge amount of work to do to go from sort of the general idea of how it works to the specifics of what physics experiments do I do? What specific things can I conclude about the general ideas of mathematics and so on? But the, you know, is one on the right track? It's like saying, is calculus on the right track? It's kind of, there is a thing and it's, it's something that we can kind of see has, has sort of deep resonance with the way that things work. And now it's a question of really working out uh, how do things actually fit together? So I think that um, uh, to just give you a little bit of maybe my personal sort of history with respect to this, because it also, I, I always find that um, uh, kind of a, a tip that I've noticed about trying to understand ideas is that um, it's uh, uh, understanding the history of those ideas often helps in understanding the content of the ideas as well. So let me, let me just offer a few comments about that um, in my, from my own kind of life and times. Uh, back in the in the late 1970s, mid to late 1970s, I was involved in kind of traditional physics. It was a time that was extremely an extremely fertile time for physics. I mean, I would say that in terms of fundamental physics, we can see there has been various sort of epochs in its development. I mean, one epoch was the kind of 1915 to 1920s type period when general relativity emerged, and then uh, quantum mechanics emerged. 
and then there was sort of a, 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 a you know even by the end of the 1920s one had the outline of quantum field theory one didn't know the details of how to actually do quantum electrodynamics how to actually do other kinds of quantum field theories but the outline of how quantum field theories should work already existed at that time well then it wasn't clear you know, it looked kind of bad, you know, maybe field theory wasn't really the right thing. Maybe there was some other kind of approach to strongly interacting particles that was going to be relevant. That was sort of the story, of the 1950s, early 1960s. Um, and then by the 1970s, with asymptotic freedom and QCD having been discovered in 1973 and so on, and uh, deep inelastic scattering, but a bunch of other things, it really was the the sort of the, the moment when it was realized, yes, field theory is actually going to work. And so there was a whole bunch of low hanging fruit to be picked was also at a time when uh, and I was quite involved in this, when uh, cosmology and general relativity had kind of emerged as uh, as sort of real things which you could do computations with, and that was something that happened in the 60s. But by the 70s, that was by the late 1970s, that was kind of converging with some of the things that were being thought about in particle physics, and this kind of idea that you know there was there was uh, there was commonality in what had to be done between cosmology and particle physics that emerged. But so the 1970s were this kind of uh, uh, another period of kind of rapid growth for um, for fundamental physics, and and I happened to be involved in that, and uh, it was um, uh, I was kind of not uh, you know I was uh, just a, a a person operating in that zone, not the initiator of those things, um, and uh, but it was an exciting time, and then uh, after that. I, well, I had been using computers to, uh, uh, this is kind of a, a, a personal tale that, that, you know, I started using computers when I was uh, kind of ancient by today's standards, like 12, 13 years old, um, because that was 1972, 1973, when computers were very antiquated compared to what they are today. Um, but uh, I had this kind of idea, you could do things like mathematical computation by computer. You didn't have to do it by hand as most people who did physics did. And the shocking thing was that, yes, I got to the point where I was using existing systems, I built my own system for doing sort of uh, uh, mathematics by computer. The shocking thing was that other people doing theoretical physics weren't doing that. And I just, I, you know, at the time, I just couldn't understand it. It's like, why wouldn't you use this tool? You know, there's a way to do this. And, um, uh, you know, yes, it took understanding a certain amount about how computers worked and, and those kinds of things. And you know that didn't uh, maybe if you were just trained as a physicist or something you wouldn't know those things but it wasn't terribly hard um, and uh, but it turned out that gave one sort of a superpower that you know I was able to do all these calculations and people were like how do you do these calculations you must be a brilliant uh, you know calculator no I'm not I just use a computer um, so I think the lesson from that is if there are tools that allow you to have a superpower learn them. And, you know, I've now spent the last 40 years built, trying to build our sort of super ta power tower of Wolfram language and so on. And the more fluently you know that, the more you will be able to just take ideas that you have and kind of turn them into, um, you know, really work them out. And, and that was the thing I started being able to do back in the 1970s um, with computers for doing at first fairly traditional physics. But then having built my first uh, language, called SMP, which was a kind of a forerunner of Mathematica and modern Wolfram language. Um, that was in 1979 to 1981 or so. Um, I kind of was interested in this question of, OK, so let's look at the natural world. Well, there are things that we find by sort of drilling down and finding elementary particles and so on. There are things that are more general questions about the natural world, about, uh, for example, the uh, you know how, does, how do things get to be complicated in nature? And so I got sort of interested in that and and um, started exploring, started, okay, so this was sort of the, the next step was, so what kind of model would you use to study that? So my first assumption was, I know all this fancy mathematical physics, let's just use fancy mathematical physics to study this. Didn't work. The, you know, make a model of a snowflake growing, didn't really work. Had some PDEs, couldn't solve them, didn't really, couldn't really tell what was going on. I said, what's the essential feature of what's going on? What is the, the underlying kind of, uh, um, in a sense, meta model that one needs for what's happening in these kinds of systems? And I thought, well, you know, I've just built this, this computer language 
and in this computer language, I have certain primitives. And what I've discovered is those primitives, uh, I can build up from these kind of somewhat arbitrarily chosen primitives, I can build up this whole world of everything you can do in this language. Well, maybe I can do that for nature as well. Let me just see, you know, let me just pick some primitives and see what happens. It's kind of applying the same meta idea that I had from this, um, uh, from developing this, this uh, uh, computer language to what was, and then natural science, basically. And again, kind of, I suppose, a lesson from that is that uh, it's kind of like, you've got this, this area, you know, you think you're doing physics, but actually you have ideas that come from a quite different area and a, and a way of thinking that comes from a quite different area, in that case, kind of the computational way of thinking. Now, an important piece of that story was that in building SMP, I had tried to figure out what is the, how should one think about computation? What is the, the right underlying stuff to think about in terms of computation? And what I had come up with was this whole transformation rules for symbolic expressions idea, which kind of harkens back to the early days of mathematical logic um, back in the, in the early part of the 20th century um, and uh, to the 1930s, 1940s and so on. But it was kind of a practicalization of those ideas as applied to actually doing computation. Okay, so, so that led me to kind of start thinking about, okay, so if you just think about, you know, these primitives for the natural world, what are the simple primitives? Okay, let's look at simple programs. Let's look at cellular automata. Then because I could use computers, I could immediately do experiments on cellular automata. And my first, uh, the first thing was, gosh, these experiments don't work the way I thought they would work. Now, another kind of cautionary tale, I suppose, is that like rule 30, my kind of all-time favorite cellular automaton, I first generated that in 1981. I didn't really pay attention to it until 1984, because basically I didn't really have the intellectual framework to think about what was going on in rule 30. It's just like I sort of assumed that, oh, well, you know, I could study what happened with random initial conditions. I knew dynamical systems theory and a bunch of other kinds of approaches. And I, I could kind of engage with that. But this thing about simple initial conditions, simple rule, very complicated behavior was just sort of outside of my lexicon of what, what I thought was possible and in, in, to happen. So then what I think the, um, uh, the, the, the thing was uh, uh, kind of the, Okay, so, so another thing was going on at the same time was cellular automata, they did different things. Well, I guess by the time I saw rule, really understood rule 30, I was realizing, gosh, it was the case that the simple rules, simple initial conditions, you could generate complicated behavior. But I wasn't sure it was really complicated. I thought, oh, I can use the renormalization group, I can use number theory, I can use some other technique, and somehow this little system that I've got will be able to be kind of crushed down to something simpler. So I tried to do that. And actually sort of a number of very good mathematicians who I knew, I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton at the time, um, and uh, was a sort of hotbed of, of top mathematicians, got interested in the same kind of thing. And they were like, yeah, we can, we can solve this. You know, We know all these fancy mathematical methods, we're gonna solve it. Okay, so we all tried doing this and nobody really got anywhere. And so the thing that I only realized very recently is what was significant about that moment, which was that the, my mathematician friends just said, look, our methods don't work, we give up, we're done. What, what I realized was, and again, it took me an extra few decades to actually realize kind of the historical arc of, of what was going on there. What I realized was the very fact that one had got stuck was itself incredibly interesting. And in fact, that was probably more interesting than any of the details of what one might have been able to pick away at. That phenomenon that, you know, in this computational universe of possible programs, you don't, you can't crush the whole thing. That was a very important thing. And, and that was what led to this idea of computational irreducibility, which I kind of understood by around 1984 or so. And um, that led to, uh, so that kind of led to the, the realization that sort of computational ideas were critically important in, in thinking about natural science. Well, the, uh, uh, then, you know, then, then I started building Mathematica in, in 1986 and I kind of got um, uh, diverted from basic science and then came back to it around 1991. 
And at that time, I was like, yes, there are simple programs that can do complicated things. I know one example, it's cellular automata. I've developed some general idea about how computation can be relevant and, and things like uh, computational irreducibility and so on can be more generally relevant. And I certainly imagined that computational irreducibility was more generally applicable to, you know, who knows what the three body problem, all kinds of things in, in, uh, in, in, in physics and in, in, um, uh, in natural science in general. I mean, the, the idea, I'm sure you all know this, but, but uh, you know, the sort of the key point of computational irreducibility is once you have the, you might think once you have the rules by which a system operates, then you're done. You can predict everything about what the system will do. And that's kind of the, the, the sentiment that you get from sort of traditional mathematical science. But in fact, computational irreducibility says that isn't the case, that in general, you have to basically follow each step. You can't make those kind of shortcuts. There's no way that you as an observer of the system can be computationally more sophisticated than the system itself. You can't jump ahead and say, and so the answer is 42 or whatever. You just have to follow every step just like the system does. So that's kind of the concept of computational irreducibility. And again, I'd sort of seen these pretty good examples you know, the proof of that, and that's a that's a complicated story of, of to what extent you can prove that phenomenon and how you kind of nail that down and so on. Um, and that's a that's a long running story. But um, uh, the, you know, sort of seen how that worked in um, uh, in cellular automata, didn't know how it worked elsewhere. So 1991, I, I started working on on um, the, uh, you know, the NKS book, the, 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 the thing that eventually turned into this big book, which is now 20 years old. Um, just had its 20th anniversary. And in fact, I, I'm, I'm now very aware of its history because I just, for its 20th anniversary, I really went back and looked in my archives and tried to remember how did the, how did the book really evolve? And, and one of the main things I found was that, that again, a, a sort of story of pivoting a bit. The book originally was about how does complexity happen in nature? And by, the, by a little ways in, I kind of thought I knew the answer to that. And then I realized actually the much bigger picture is this new kind of science that you build from thinking about everything computationally, from studying simple programs in the computational universe and so on. But then the big result was that it, you know, I, I knew about cellular automata. Then I started looking at all kinds of other programs from, from Turing machines to tiling systems to even partial differential equations. And the, the first big discovery was this same phenomenon of simple rules, complicated behavior happens everywhere. And from that, I was led to this principle of computational equivalence, this idea of this sort of fundamental computational equivalence of all these different kinds of systems. And the principle of computational equivalence and computational irreducibility, these are two kind of core ideas of sort of the computational paradigm for science. And I think they're, they're sort of the analog in our times of what might have been, I don't know, the idea of force and momentum and energy or something in, in previous times. These are kind of guiding principle ideas that uh, uh, are sort of core things that, that I think one has to get sort of very conceptually familiar with so that one can reason in terms of them. Now, you know, I will say, for those of you who are kind of mathematically oriented and so on, that if you say, okay, prove this or that property of these things, it's actually very hard. And it's, I don't feel quite as bad about the fact that we haven't been able to do it because all kinds of people have tried to do it for 150 years because this is basically directly related to the, to the second law of thermodynamics and to something that, for example, David Hilbert spent, I don't know, I, I only learned this recently, that he'd spent like a, a, a decade trying to understand how do you go from atomic type things to the continuum? How do you go from molecular dynamics to fluid mechanics? Um, the, the, the full mathematical sort of nailing down of that has not been done. The big thing that I think is, is now pretty clear is that the fundamental why does the second law of thermodynamics work, which has always been a muddle, um, it is because of computational irreducibility, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, it, it's all because of the interplay between us as observers with our bounded computational abilities and the underlying systems with their intrinsic computational irreducibility. That is the origin of the second law of thermodynamics. But nailing down all those details requires that you be able to characterize things like what are we like as observers? And you can, that is not, it's not obvious what we're like as observers. That's a kind of thing that science hasn't really had to address. 
and we can somewhat axiomatize, we can start to think about axiomatizing what are we like as observers that leads to the very modern stuff that we're working on about observer theory. Maybe I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a few minutes. But in any case, back to the sort of uh, historical narrative, so to speak. So sort of the, the big point of um, uh, the, the NKS book um, ended up being sort of, okay, there's this way of thinking about models in science, which is computationally, thinking about simple uh, computational rules and what their consequences are, and a, a kind of a different way of thinking about how you model things. And uh, I suppose the big point there was, uh, what I came to realize is that there have been a few epochs in sort of the history of, of making models of things. One could say that the very first epoch was kind of in antiquity, where people were saying, what is the world made of? Is it made of atoms? Is it made of this? Is it made of that? It's kind of a structural period where, where the big story is just sort of what is something made of, so to speak. Then that was the dominant form of science for, you know, a couple of thousand years, basically. And in many fields of science, that's still where we're at. It's still, you know, in a lot of areas of biology and things like that, it's what is stuff made of? And, and that's a, it's a perfectly productive kind of science. I mean, you know, it, it's both what is it made of or make a flow chart for it. These are the same kinds of things. It's kind of the static picture of how are things constructed. So then the big sort of surprise of the late 1600s, mid to late 1600s, was this kind of the mathematical, you know, as, as Isaac Newton put it, you know, the title of his book was Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. The idea that you could wheel mathematics into natural philosophy or physics um, and, and, and have something useful come out. The idea that you could basically just have a formula, an equation that describes how things in the world work. You could have, you know, the universal law of gravity or whatever else. It's an equation that describes how things in the world work. It doesn't tell you structurally how the thing is made. It's just an equation that tells you this is how the world works. And at first, people were very resistant to that idea. But um, in, in a little while, it became clear it was a very useful idea. You could compute all kinds of things, whether it's orbits of comets or all sorts of other stuff. And so over the next, over the uh, 300 years after that, that became kind of the dominant form of science, that it was kind of use mathematics, or at least of exact science, use kind of mathematics to essentially write down a formula, write down an equation for how things will work. And it works very well in lots of areas. Now, it, uh, uh, in a sense that, but it gives you certain expectations. For example, one expectation it gives you is, once you have a formula for how something works, Maybe time appears in that formula, but you just fill it in as a parameter and you can work out what will the system do at some time in the future. There's no notion of, of actually having to grind through every moment of time. It's rather just there's a formula, just go fill in the value of the time parameter and you'll know what the answer is. And that gives you the idea that exact science is about making these sort of jump ahead predictions or it's kind of effortless for, for the science to make this kind of jump ahead prediction. But so, when, you know, with my sort of NKS efforts and so on, the big point was that, okay, there's a different paradigm for thinking about science. It's a paradigm in which instead of saying, we have the answer, we can just work out this formula for the answer. We say, no, we have the rules by which we can generate an answer, by which we can generate a simulation of the behavior, but we're not, we're not immediately able to sort of solve it and say, this is the answer. We're not able to give some formula for the answer. And computational irreducibility is the big sort of thing that stands in the way between uh, of doing that. And kind of the way I've, I've seen it in, in recent times is kind of an evolution in the way one thinks about time. In the structural paradigm for, for science, there isn't really any time. It's just what's stuff made of. In the mathematical paradigm, it's like there's time, but it's just a parameter and it can, it can be filled in with any value. In the computational paradigm, time is something that has sort of a meaningful character. It is the inexorable progress of computation. That is sort of the measure of time, so to speak. And the progress of time is measured in, in the progress of a computation. And, and the, the, the existence of computational irreducibility is the thing that makes sort of time meaningful, that, that allows there to be something that is, a, that is sort of achieved by the, by the passage of time. Okay, so in any case, that was sort of this, this, this effort to make a, a new paradigm for thinking about science. And you can say, well, how did that go? 
And the answer is, although I think almost nobody noticed, it was just amazingly successful because in the 20 years or so, you know, in the last I don't know, 20 years-ish, that there's been this transition from when new models are made of things, before that, they were made in terms of equations. Nowadays, most of the time, they're made in terms of programs. And that's, that's a kind of somewhat silent but very dramatic transition that's happened um, in, in science and so on over that period of time. And I don't think people have fully internalized yet the significance of that transition in terms of what kinds of phenomena are important to think about. You know, computational irreducibility tells you that certain kind of, that this that this test of predictability of yes, we can jump ahead, we can work out what's going to happen in this or that system. That's not necessarily what you're going to see um, in this in this kind of paradigm. And it, you know, you don't have the full predictions just when you have the underlying rules. You can you can run the simulation explicitly, but you don't get to just sort of say, and the answer is X. Um, as 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 uh, as immediately as you do in kind of the mathematical paradigm. So in any case, that that um, uh, so that's got sort of the the big picture is you've got this new raw material for making models of things. It comes from computation, and uh, you also have a new raw material for for mining technology from this computational universe. That's a somewhat different story. But then the the the, the obvious question is, okay, so what about fundamental physics? And when my NKS book came out, uh, I was kind of it was kind of an interesting phenomenon because in lots of fields of science, people were like, oh, great, new modeling methodology. The one area where people were like pitchforks and uh, and all this kind of thing was fundamental physics. That was particularly ironic because essentially all of the pitchforkers were daily users of our technology. And many of them were people that I'd known for many years. So it was kind of interesting that there was this very kind of uh, uh, visceral, oh my gosh, this can't be relevant to fundamental physics kind of kind of belief. And I think in, uh, you know, it's, it's like uh, one well-known such person who said to me, you know, if you're right, it's going to like explode everything we've done for the last 50 years. And to which I, my main response was, I doubt that that will be the case because, you know, what's been done, what we're talking about is something at a very different level from what has been been studied in physics to, in the last 50 years. But anyway, um, as it was, it was kind of a, a uh, uh, it didn't seem like a great market for developing fundamental physics when the people who were in its primary market uh, were like, please don't do this project type thing. So I went and built Wolfram Language and built Wolfram Alpha and, and things like that. And then um, at our summer school, actually, in 2019, um, uh, Max Piskanoff and, and Jonathan Gorard were there, and I had made a, a sort of minor technical, um, not really breakthrough, but minor technical un, uh, uh, uncobwebbing or something of the way that I was thinking about the underlying models, and I'm telling them about this, and they're like, uh, you know, you've really got to do this. It's got to, you know, you've got to work out, work out, does this work or not? And so we got started on this project. And remarkably quickly in the in the late 2019, early 2020, um, made just amazing progress, much greater progress than I ever thought was possible. Um, I really thought that, you know, in my lifetime, so to speak, the best we will be able to do is start talking about the first 10 to the minus 100 seconds of the universe. And we'd be arguing about kind of micro details of, of you know, does this really, could anything emerge? But instead, we started to be able to see kind of the big picture of how physics as we know it emerges. And, and that sort of was very exciting. Of course, we were about to announce this stuff when, when a, a pandemic descended. And so that, um, that led to other, other issues. But so let's talk a bit about the architecture of what we figured out. And then I want to talk about some uh, sort of, I'm gonna talk about kind of several levels here. There's, there's kind of, what we figured out, I'm not gonna talk about that in detail because you probably have read about it and lots of other people will talk about it. Um, I'm gonna talk about sort of the overall architecture and what I see as the, as the current challenges. Then I'll talk about, I'll talk first about physics, then we will descend into the Rouliad, which is sort of the more general thing that underlies physics. And we'll talk about the kind of philosophical character of the Rouliad and its relationship to physics. And then we'll emerge again and talk about metamathematics. Um, that's, uh, that's my plan here. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about the general paradigm of multi-computation. 
Okay, so let's start on uh, on some physics here. So um, let me just uh, bring up something here, just to have something to talk about. Um, so uh, let's bring up this visual summary of um, of the physics project. And as I, I think you all know, uh, sort of a, a key starting point for the physics project is this idea that space is not a continuous thing. Just like fluids are not continuous things, they're made of molecules, space is not continuous, it's made of atoms of space. That's an idea, by the way, that people thought would be, uh, you know, they thought that was going to how it was was going to be how it was going to work right when quantum theory was was originating in fact people have sent me endless times now the quote from einstein from 1916 that says uh, it was just after the invention of general relativity you know it says in the end space time will turn out to be discrete but we don't have the tools yet to be able to analyze how that will work and so then it took another 100 years and so now uh you know old albert was right um that seems to be how it actually works so the I think the um, so the sort of the the starting point here is this notion that space is is made of discrete things, discrete elements of space, atoms of space, one might call them. Um, the uh, later on we'll talk about how that sort of the more general concept of atoms of existence and what we're calling EMEs, EMEs um, that. Uh, uh, correspond to those atoms of existence, but in the way of talking about them in terms of physics, we're interpreting them as atoms of space. And the only thing we say about these atoms of space is how they're related to each other. We make this hypergraph that represents relations, a collection of relations between atoms of space. And then sort of the, the big idea is that um, uh, we look at rewriting rules, let's say local rewriting rules on uh, little regions of that hypergraph, we take the limit as we apply those rewriting rules many times. We see what kind of structures we get. Okay, so the and and the main point is that we imagine that those structures eventually limit to something like continuum space time, um, or continuum space at least. The, the spatial hypergraph limits to something which is continuous space. When we're looking at the the sort of the history of updates and so on, then. Uh, then we we are generating causal graphs and space time and so on. But so first big question is, okay, so you've got this big hypergraph and um, it's kind of somehow limiting to something like space. How does that limit actually work? And we can compute things about it. We can compute the effect of dimension. We can compute all kinds of geometry, GD6, all sorts of other things. Um, but how does that really work? Well, one thing that is true is that it's it's not necessarily integer dimensional. It, it's not like a manifold with integer dimensional space that's locally Euclidean and all those kinds of things. It's some new and weird kind of object. And essentially one of the projects that we are trying to do these days is this kind of thing. I don't know what its final name will be, but we've been sort of internally calling it infra calculus. Kind of what is the generalization of calculus that applies to things that don't end up being like manifolds that apply to things like these limiting hypergraphs. How do we construct all the ideas of calculus and, and differential geometry and all those kinds of things? You know, what's a Riemann tensor in 2.6 dimensions, things like this. So that's a kind of a big mathematical build out that we're in the, in the process of doing, and which I think is gonna be very fertile. And we've certainly done pieces of that, but I want to see that be done more systematically. As one does that, so as we start looking at, well, what does this limiting structure look like? It's kind of a, a thing that is qualitatively like the story of you take a bunch of molecules bouncing around in a fluid and you say, what are the emergent equations of fluid dynamics? I happened to work on that for cellular automata back in the mid 1980s and the derivation of the fluid equations from an underlying discrete dynamics. This is a similar case. And the question is, what is that? What are the emergent equations? And Basically, with a whole bunch of footnotes and a whole bunch of untied down mathematics, the answer is it's Einstein's equations. An important piece of that story is the identification of energy with activity in the network. Um, and so that's that's kind of another part of the story. There's also stories about causal invariance and so on. There's, there's lots of stuff that I'm not going to talk about here. But basically, the sort of architectural point is the continuum limit of this hypergraph rewriting process uh, is the analog of the fluid equations is Einstein's equations. Now, 
let's, you know, we'd love to nail that down better. Uh, you know, Jonathan has done some work trying to actually do kind of numerical relativity by using these kinds of techniques. We'd love to see more of that done. We'd love to actually see how, uh, how one can do practical numerical relativity. This seems to be a good scheme for doing practical numerical relativity. But more than that, that kind of gives evidence that our model is really working because we can say, look, we can compute black hole mergers just like people who start from Einstein's equations and discretize them. We are starting from the discrete underlying dynamics and coming up to something which has kind of continuum-like behavior. But what's more important about that is as we do that, we can both validate that we're actually getting the same answer, but we can also see how do we deviate from the answers that are gotten from using continuum equations? How do we see, uh, for example, the effects of you know, shot noise on some rapidly rotating black hole? How do, we see, how do we see down in sort of some gravitational microscope down to the underlying uh, sort of atoms of space? Uh, can we use some weird, uh, I guess one of the big questions there is sort of, uh, uh, you know, when you make up experiments, you're kind of you're kind of poking at different parts of nature to try and see how it works. So if you have fluid dynamics, you don't self-evidently know that there are molecules in a fluid. That's something that you have to come up with a clever experiment. You know, you have to invent Brownian motion and realize you can look at pollen grains bouncing around and see that there's something molecular in, in the fluid. Or you have to look at hypersonic flow or something and see that there is something sort of uh, molecular about the fluid. So similarly for space time, we'd really like to find, are there effects where we can see down to this kind of uh, uh, level of atoms of space? You know, is there some weird gravitational lensing effect? Is there some effect of, uh, you know, photons in orbit around a black hole? These kinds of things where you can see that. And we kind of expect that there will be, for example, dimension fluctuations in the early universe that because we think the, the universe, basically we can think of it as starting infinite dimensional and gradually sort of cooling down. We don't know, like the Friedman Robertson Walker metric uh, for, uh, for an evolving universe, we'd love to have a version of that, that accounts for dimension change, um, because the, the, that accounts for the evolution of dimension as well as the evolution of curvature. Um, and we suspect that there will be curvat dimension fluctuations left over from the early universe, and those might be observable, for example, in the cosmic microwave background. So we kind of expect that there'll be some absolutely bizarre effects that uh, one never would have expected could possibly be there that will be suggested by our models, but we need to actually nail down how do you actually do the astrophysics experiments and so on to see those things. And I mean, we've been uh, it's very nice that... Um, uh, very unlike the the time of the pitchforking of of uh, from 20 years ago, I would say that the response to to what we've been doing has been very positive, and we've sort of been been uh, inundated with experimentalists saying, you know, just tell us what to look for, and we're like, we don't know what to tell you yet because there's a bunch of actual physics that has to be done to go from this sort of underlying model to uh, to the thing that you can actually point a telescope at and, and see what's going on. So that's a that's a thing that I think is a very important thing to do. I'm a little bit you know, if, if I were to say what's ahead of schedule, what's behind schedule in terms of what I might have expected from the development of the project, I would say sort of the phenomenology of the connection between our models and what's observable is maybe a little bit behind schedule um, uh, at, at this point and something where I think there's a lot of fertile stuff to be done. Now, I might also mention, uh, well, let's let's uh, go on and talk. Well, I, OK, there are. No, let, let me go on and talk about quantum mechanics. Sort of the big idea there is this idea of multi-way systems, the idea that there can be many different rewrites that can happen. And don't just say, I want to pick this particular rewrite. I want to be running a, you know, you know, the universe is a Monte Carlo simulation or something, but we're just going to pick one path. No, you're looking at all paths. And those paths, sometimes they branch, sometimes they merge. We generate this multi-way graph. I just did a, an analysis recently about games like tic-tac-toe, where you have multi-way graphs where the different possible moves you can make correspond to different branches you can follow. And then if you get to the same board configuration, that's a merge. And you can study those in terms of multi-way graphs. You can study many, way, many things in terms of multi-way graphs. In fact, this whole sort of pure multi-computation idea is itself a very fertile one for studying all kinds of systems. So in any case, 
the um the, the sort of the big idea there is inevitably you end up with getting a multi-way graph from these models of ours from the the microscopic updates in the in the in this hypergraph there are many possible uh, sequences of updates that can occur many possible uh threads of history, so to speak, that can be produced. And you get these complicated pictures. Well, this is a multi-way causal graph here, but the, the, the skeleton of this is a multi-way graph. And each, each one of the nodes here is the state of the universe. And there are different, you can get branchings, you can get mergings and so on. So the story of quantum mechanics, we think, is, so we're pretty sure, is very sure, actually, I would say at this point, is, is the story of this whole branching of all these different possible histories for the universe. Now, one of the features of that is, okay, so in, in physical space, we know how that's sort of laid out in the hypergraph. What is the thing that you get by slicing across this multi-way graph? It's another kind of space. We call it branchial space. It's the space of possible, let's say, quantum branches. And you can say, which branch is near what other branch? Well, you can look in terms of common ancestry in the multi-way graph. That gives you some, some sense of distance in branchial space. So branchial space is sort of the space in which quantum states play out. And we can start asking about all kinds of things about, about branchial space. Well, let, let me say something about us as observers of what's going on. In physical space, we're not sensitive to the individual atoms of space because we're really big compared to the atoms of space. And so we sort of average out big chunks of, of this, and that's, that's why we think of space as a continuum. In the case of branchial space, we're also kind of big compared to the individual threads here because just as the universe is branching all the time, so too our brains are branching. So in a sense, the story of quantum mechanics becomes the story of how does a branching brain perceive a branching universe? And that, that's, um, and so it's all about sort of how big are we in branchial space? What kind of, uh, what kind of, um, what kind of sampling of branchial space are we taking? Just like we might say about physical space, what kind of sampling of physical space are we taking? So there's there's a lot of uh, that we uh, there's a lot we don't understand about branchial space. For example, we don't really understand how to coordinateize branchial space. We have indications in certain simple cases, but even something like the double slit experiment, we really want to nail down more precisely how does the coordinatization of branchial space relate to physical coordinates of of angles and things like that. Have some ideas, but it doesn't. I would say fully nailed down. I think that the um, uh, the question, you know, our, our rough interpretation is that position in branchial space corresponds to quantum phase. And kind of the statement that uh, I've been making is that just like in the case of space time, I didn't really talk about this actually, that the in space time, people kind of got the idea as a result of things Minkowski did in 1909 or so, that um, space and time are the same kind of thing, which not really in agreement with our intuitive uh, expectations, but in our models, space and time are not the same kind of thing. Space is the extension of the spatial hypergraph. Time is the inexorable kind of uh, computation of next states and so on. So the bundling of space and time together may have been a mistake in physics. And similarly, we tend to think that the bundling of quantum phase and quantum magnitude is also a mistake. That quantum phase is a different kind of thing. Its position in branchial space, quantum magnitude, is more of counting of the number of paths in the multi-ray graph. So, okay, so there's a, a the, there's this whole sort of story of branchial space. There's the whole uh, uh, the whole thing we've been doing about looking at multi-ray graphs as a an underlying way to look at uh, quantum mechanics, and that looks very promising through ZX calculus and things like that. It seems that we can pretty much compile sort of standard quantum mechanics and things like quantum information, quantum circuits, and so on into multi-way graphs, and then compute there, and then sort of translate back. And so that's, again, that's a great way of validating our models is to say, look, they're actually just directly equivalent to, perhaps in some limit, to what you normally see in quantum information. And actually we've been, we now have our quantum framework that's been rather nicely developed. Nick has been, Nick Mersin has been very involved in that as MADS has been recently. Um, the, uh, 
uh, Jonathan's been involved in, in the past. M multiple people have been involved. Um, but uh, uh, Nick just won some nice quantum computing competition by using our framework, which is nice, U using our quantum framework in Waltham language. Um, that's not yet as completely connected to the things that we're doing uh, in multi-way graphs as it, as it could be. Jonathan's done a bunch of work, Xerxes, Hatem, I've also worked on that, on that connection. Um, so uh, in any case, the, the, um, that, that's quantum mechanics, then there's quantum field theory, and then there's quantum gravity. And all of those things are kind of part of, of the story. For quantum field theory, the big point is to sort of combine the spatial degrees of freedom with these branchial degrees of freedom. And that's just a, a mathematical, well, I wouldn't say mess, it's, it's very interesting, very rich, but it's complicated. And the, because here, every single node has the complete state of the universe, which is incredibly wasteful because between this node and this node, there's very little difference. And, but yet we're sort of representing our data structure is such that we're sort of copying the whole universe over here. So there's also the notion of local multiway systems and global multiway systems, which are ways to kind of refactor how you present the data of a multiway system. And that story of that refactoring, I think ends up being the story of quantum field theory. And just as we can talk about doing direct uh, sort of uh, simulations of, of space time using our models, we also will expect to be able to do direct simulation of quantum field theory using our models, kind of giving one a, a, a different kind of story from lattice gauge theories and things like that, a more direct way to just do quantum field theory computations um, using, uh, using the sort of underlying discrete stuff. So that's, a, that's another direction. Then comes quantum gravity. Uh, we kind of think that uh, the the, the multi-way causal graph is the thing that sort of knits together spatial structure and branchial structure. That's probably, that knitting together is probably exactly the ADS-CFT correspondence that again needs to be nailed down better. And the extent to which you can kind of project in the spatial direction or in the branchial direction and get kind of the, the general relativity or the, or the field theory side of things. Um, but that's, that seems to be a, a very much a concretization of the kinds of things people have thought about in, in other areas of mathematical physics. And so this is another theme, is that what we have seems to be kind of the, a, an explicit machine code raw material for lots of different approaches to mathematical physics. And that's something that, again, is a very nice feature of what's emerged from these models, something I didn't expect at all, is sort of everybody's right. It's not the case that you know we're right and everybody else is wrong. No, actually, everybody is right. Um, one's taking different kinds of limits and things like this. So you know, spin networks, uh, you know, um, uh, causal set theory, causal dynamical triangulations, probably string theory. Um, these are all things which seem to emerge as various kinds of limits and specializations of our kind of model. Um, now, there's a lot more to be done in nailing all of that down. I mean, we have the qualitative picture, I think, and a number of people at, at uh, previous summer schools and winter schools have worked on these things, but there's more to be done to kind of have the definitive nailing down of those things. And among other things, I'm, I'm really curious whether my kind of ridiculous pun of the fact that um, string theory is the continuum limit of string rewriting systems turns out to be correct. Something like that is probably true. Whether that actual pun turns out to be exactly the right thing, I don't know yet. But anyway, so, th th so that's a, another kind of a big direction is, is sort of connect what we're doing to other approaches to mathematical physics. Um, and I think there will be, that's a very fertile thing, both for, for our project and for those, uh, uh, those other approaches to mathematical physics. Okay, so uh, that's uh, sort of a very rough outline of, of some of where we're at. I mean, when I talk about the physics project, there, there are pieces, there are, there are great big gaping holes. Um, so as we do this infra calculus and we understand how to really, how to really set up the structure of, um, uh, of kind of uh, the things that we're used to in, in you know, differential geometry and things like that, um, there are there are things that we can then start to see, like what's a particle? Well, we think a particle is a topological obstruction of some kind, kind of like a vortex and a fluid type thing, but really nail that down. You know, what does it mean when we have uh, something like a, 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 a fiber bundle embedded in our emerging from these systems that we're looking at? 
what what do what does local gauge endurance look like? We we've got pretty good ideas about this, and and toy projects have been done, but we need to continue that. We need to even understand what does rotational invariance really correspond to in these hypergraph systems and so on. How does the how does a, a Lie group continuous group emerge? We get some idea of how continuous space emerges. How does something like a a, a Lie group emerge? And and one of the big questions is what is generic and what is not and what emerges. So for example, we don't think that three dimensions is a generic result that emerges, but it's possible that the Lie group, you know, that, that everything you get has to be a subgroup of E8 or something. We don't know, that's possible. That will be a very exciting thing to discover. And it might be something that is a, a necessary feature of these models. Now there's another whole direction here, which uh, uh, I would say Jonathan, Xerxes, et cetera, have been working on, which is kind of the 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 kind of um, connecting this to sort of mathematical structures like in category theory, higher category theory, and so on, and understanding kind of the the uh, the relations between sort of using that as a framework to think about what we're doing and using what we're doing as a framework to think about those kinds of things. James Boyd has also been involved in in, in this in this effort. So the um, uh, and um, Actually, most people have been involved. I haven't been as involved in that effort as as uh, in some of these other things. Um, but in any case, the the the, the that that's sort of a another direction. Um, and uh, again, one of the things that's really great about our models is they're very concrete. I mean, they're they're you know it reminds me greatly sort of in terms of history of science with what happened with Turing machines. You know, people had combinators, they had lambda calculus, they had. Um, uh, uh, you know, various kinds of rewrite systems and so on. But it was Turing machines that made people kind of understand concretely what was this thing that was abstractly being thought about, not really in a coherent way, that emerged as computation. And I think what we have uh, with our models is sort of a similar kind of concrete machine code from which a lot of things can be built. So in any case, the, the, that's sort of a, a rough outline of, of some things with the physics project. Let's now go deeper down the rabbit hole, okay? So one of the big questions that emerged with the physics project was, let's say we're successful. We managed to find a rule that can reproduce physics as we know it. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I missed one thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about particles. So I talk about you know making local gauge invariants, fiber bundles, things like this, and these topological obstructions. I mean, we want to find the electron. You know, we will be able to find something like that, but we haven't done it yet. And that's one of the things, but I think we need a certain amount of more infrastructure development before we can get to the point of being able to do that. And, you know, if you're a particle physicist, the thing you always have to do is, you know, find the spectrum of particles. That's kind of the name of the game in particle physics. And I think there are all sorts of exotic possibilities in our models. And to even know what's conceivable, like very low mass particles that, you know, maybe dark matter like things or who knows, or weird things that aren't really particles in the ordinary sense of localization and so on. These are things we should understand because these are things one could go out and actually look for in the physical world. And if you're in the business of making models of physics, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very useful to make something like calculus, which provides sort of a way of computing things, but it's kind of a good wow factor. If you can say, go turn the telescope in that direction, you'll see this weird thing and somebody does it and they actually see that weird thing. That has a very high wow factor and it's something that we would uh, we would like to see happen. Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, and whether that is accessible in 2020, you know, to 2023, uh, 2057, I don't know, but uh, it's something which I, I think it will be, uh, it will be frustrating if we just hadn't kicked those tires to find out if it's something accessible in 2022 or 2023. So in any case, okay, let's let's go further down the rabbit hole. So question is, you think you have, uh, you know, you've got this rule and it reproduces physics as we know it. Weird situation, because you say, why was it that rule and not another rule? And I was wondering about that for ages and ages and ages. And what became clear from this whole multi-way way of thinking about things is actually just think about what would happen if, if, if all possible rules were followed, what would you get then? And as an observer embedded in this thing where all possible rules are being followed, where you also have all possible rules being followed inside you, what do you observe? And how does it relate to what we actually see? And that led to this idea of the Rouliad. Uh, the Rouliad is 
the entangled limit of all possible computational processes. So, you know, you can look at it, that's a very abstract concept, but you can break it down, you can sort of coordinate it in a variety of ways. So, for example, one coordination would be take those computational processes to be Turing machines and just say, start off all possible Turing machines with all possible initial conditions, let them run. What do you get? Well, you might say you're not going to get anything with any structure at all, but you'd be wrong because the equivalences between states of Turing machines means that a Turing machine, you might start with one state, there are two different Turing machines, they end up with two different states, then you run them again, and then they can merge to produce the same state again. And, and so I made lots of pictures of, of uh, what you get in the sort of rule limit of Turing of multi-way Turing machines um, and how you make sort of a coordination of the rule ad using Turing machines, for example. But so the rule ad is the structure that is this entangled limit of all possible computations. And then, the, then what we are saying is that the rule ad is a necessary object. It just is something that given the formal structure of given just the idea of formalism, so to speak, you necessarily get the rule ad. It's just following all these rules and you don't have to say, I'm gonna pick this one, I'm gonna do this special thing, I'm gonna have this special kind of uh, uh, you know, curation of the whole thing. It just necessarily has this form. So then the question is, well, what about our observation of, uh, so if that's what's going on, uh, and uh, that, that's sort of the universe of all possible universes, all entangled together. It's not kind of a, a multiverse type thing where it's just a bunch of separate branches. This is something where everything is deeply entangled together. And so, uh, oh, you know, I, I forgot to mention one other thing. I'm just going to mention, I'm just going to go back. I'm sorry to do this. Uh, we're talking about quantum mechanics and branchial space. I just want to mention that one of the areas that I'm also really interested in is, is um, sort of what uh, sort of experimentally accessible predictions might there be from things that we can say about essentially quantum money body systems from thinking about them in terms of branch hill space. One of the things that emerges in our model is a maximum entanglement speed analogous to the speed of light in physical space. There's a maximum speed of information propagation in branch hill space. And I'm kind of suspecting that there is a way in something close to chemistry quantum chemistry to observe the effects of the of the maximum entanglement speed maybe i mean who knows what the magnitudes are we, we really have only one parameter in our models which is equivalently the elementary time the elementary length the maximum entanglement speed these are all once you have any one of those you determine just using Planck units and so on you just determine every all the other ones but we don't know that value of that parameter but so i'm sort of interested in in kind of working through how does one think about quantum many body systems in these terms and are there predictions that come out of that? All right, I'm gonna come back now to the Rouliad um, and uh, uh, just as, so, okay, the Rouliad is out there and how do we experience the Rouliad? We are taking a tiny sample. We are part of the Rouliad, but we're taking a tiny sample of the Rouliad and that is our experience of what happens in the world. Okay, so here's the important sort of philosophical point that we realized in the last year or so. It's the following point. The, as observers of the Rouliad, we know we have certain characteristics, two very important characteristics. One is we're computationally bounded. That is, we don't get to actually figure out what's happening with all those different branches, all those different computations happening in the Rouliad. It's analogous to when we look at uh, molecules bouncing around in a gas. We don't get to trace every individual molecule. We just have some aggregated uh, sort of computationally bounded representation of what's going on in the gas. So first point is it's a, um, we have a computationally bounded view of the Rouliad. One more condition. The other condition is we believe that we are persistent in time. You might think that's kind of trivial, but it isn't because at every moment in time, we're made of different atoms of space yet we believe we have a consistent thread of experience. And that fact kind of ends up driving the, um, uh, a, a whole lot of things. And so, so I think the, the, um, the point, uh, so the, those two conditions, we're computationally bounded and we have a belief that we are persistent in time. So it turns out that once you have those two conditions, combined with the principle of computational equivalence, combined with computational irreducibility, plus uh, sort of a, a bunch of other machination, 
it is essentially inevitable that you will derive general relativity and quantum mechanics, or so it seems. And in a sense, this is similar to what we've seen before. It's similar to fluid mechanics. It's similar to, to thermodynamics. You know, it doesn't matter what the underlying molecules are. You still always get the same continuum equations. For an observer like us, if we were little tiny molecular scale critters, we would probably not believe in fluid mechanics. We might not believe in thermodynamics either. But because we are observers like us, we come to the conclusion that the world works this way. And so philosophically, what we've realized is that from the Rouliad, the, the sampling that we, that observers like us take of the Rouliad is one where, where you, um, uh, where, where necessarily we get the laws of physics as we, the general laws of physics as we observe them. Um, so in, in other words, it is, it is our nature as observers that essentially combined with the necessary character of the Rouliad that gives us the physics that we, we are familiar with. Now you can ask, okay, what about the aliens who operate differently and don't sort of have those conditions? Well, they will observe a different physics and their physics will be perhaps bizarrely incoherent with ours. Now, for example, even in the evolution of our own sort of civilization, so to speak, we can expect changes like as we are able to be uh, to have sensors that measure different things about the world, we are essentially moving outward in Rulial space. Or even as we have different ways of thinking about our models of how the world works, we're kind of moving in Rulial space. And we can expect some sort of gradual expansion in Rulial space as our technology and as our methods of thinking about things improve. We are, we're sort of gradually able to see further in Rulial space. Now, I mean, things get, things get very weird here because because I mean, sort of at a philosophical level, the uh, you know being at different places in Rulial space correspond to having different views of how the universe works, and so every different mind has a slightly different view of how the universe works. Human minds have uh, fairly consistent and coherent views about how things work in the world. They are close together in Rulial space. By the time you get to, I don't know, a dog or something, there are certain things you can see are pretty much the same. You know, it wags its tail when it's excited and so on. You can kind of interpret that. As you get further away in Rulial space to, you know, the weather, which might have a mind of its own, so to speak, that mind is far away in Rulial space and, and very hard to interconvert with the, with the kinds of concepts that we have. But as we kind of, in a sense, develop further, our own sort of technology and way of thinking about things, we're kind of moving outwards and exploring real space. One of the things that I sort of realized recently, should have realized a long time ago, is that one of the bizarre features of, of NKS and of what we now call ruleology, just looking at uh, different possible rules out in the computational universe, is you get to do these kind of jumps through real space. While, while many of the things we do are sort of gradual expansion where we're kind of connecting them back to typical human experience, when we just say, oh, pick a random rule out in, in, in the Rouliad or in, in, in the computational universe, pick a random rule, there's no human connection necessarily to that. And so that's, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of a, a, a different experience of kind of going out and, and doing that. Anyway, there's, there's lots of kind of philosophical and fairly, fairly deep philosophical things about, about uh, kind of uh, definitions of technology and consciousness and all sorts of things like that, that um, uh, come out of this thinking about the Rouliad. Maybe I won't talk about those particularly here, um, but that's something which to me is, is important as a way to sort of understand uh, uh, the kind of the bigger picture of what's going on. Some of, some of the questions that one, one ends up asking are questions that were asked a thousand years ago, but were kind of, by the time mathematical science took off, people said, that's going great. Let's, you know, we don't have a way to ask those kinds of questions. Let's not worry about those for right now. We're, we're back to the after the right now, so to speak. So we get to think about some of those kinds of things. And there are a lot of very weird ideas. I mean, for example, uh, the analog of particles in Rulial space is kind of something which a particle is like something that maintains its coherence through time moving in space. Even the fact that pure motion is possible, even in physical space is not a trivial thing. The fact that you can take a thing and move it without it changing is not obvious. You know, near a space-time singularity, we even know from traditional general relativity that you take a thing and it's gonna get smooshed 
and it's not going to stay the same as it just sort of moves around in space. Well, in our models, we have to kind of derive the fact that there is pure motion, the fact that you can take a thing and for an observer like us, have it move without change. Because the thing is, is, is changing in the sense it's made of different atoms of space, but at least for an observer like us, it seems, oh, that's just a particle that just moved around. So anyway, so you can ask questions like, what's the analog of a particle in real space? And I think that is a kind of a thing that moves from one essentially mind to another without change. And that kind of ends up being something like sort of a, one can interpret as something like a robust concept. Because, you know, two minds have a completely different representation internally, like two neural nets, and there's a good thing somebody could study, actually, of looking at two different neural nets that got, you know, learnt things in two different ways. And uh, the question is, is there some robust thing that can be can move from one to the other? That becomes something that's sort of a concept that is moves without change in real space. Okay, so we're, we're kind of descending into sort of uh, deeper philosophical kinds of things. And there, there are lots of things one can start to unravel, I think. And it's, it's been lots of fun recently to thinking about some of those kinds of things. But let's come back out in a different direction. Let's talk about mathematics. So the question is, uh, from this point of view of, uh, of thinking about things and sort of figuring out what are the underlying structures in, uh, of things, how do we think about mathematics? So uh, let me bring up something here. Um, let's see, oh, where do I have it? Ah, oh, we go, okay, let's see. That was a good place to start, all right. Um, actually, I'm gonna to go to a different place. Yeah, this is that 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 first thing there, that alien intelligence and the concept of technology was the thing I wrote last week or so. It's kind of an interesting philosophical application of some of these kinds of things, um, talking about, well, what the title says. Uh, um, okay, and talk about metamathematics. So, okay. So let's talk about kind of... Um, how we construct mathematics. And one of the things we're going to say is that physics is ultimately our sampling of the Rouliad. Physics is kind of the emergent thing for us as observers from this inevitable necessary object that is the Rouliad. The claim we're gonna make is that mathematics is exactly the same kind of thing. It too emerges from the Rouliad, but by a different kind of sampling, that the mathematical observer is different from the physical observer. Both have certain characteristics in common that are a consequence of essentially the fact that they're both humans, so to speak, that humans are at the bottom of both of those kinds of observation, but they have differences. Okay, so let's talk about kind of what mathematics, how we start constructing mathematics. So we want to talk about what's the sort of the meta model of mathematics. So we can think about mathematics as defined, you think about it as having some kind of, we, we typically, you know, this is the Hilbert Russell, et cetera, kind of idea. Uh, well, it goes back to Euclid in some sense and through Piano and Frege and people like that. This idea of let's represent mathematics by having axioms, and then let's derive theorems from those axioms. And uh, so we, we're going to then, we can just build up these networks, which say, given a particular, in this case, an expression, we have certain axioms that derives another expression, a true theorem of mathematics will then be a path in this network of possible expressions where every edge here is uh, corresponds to an axiom of our, of our system of mathematics and then a proof is the steps on that path saying, how do we transform from this expression to this expression? Now, at a slightly more technical level, it's convenient to think about things in terms of, um, let's see, oh boy, lots of technical stuff here. Um, the, the, um, to think about things where we, where we have the nodes in our graph are um, our actual, relations. And what we're doing is we're applying laws of inference, entailments to these relations, to these theorems, 
to derive other theorems. And it's a story of multi-way graphs, again, because from one theorem, you get to derive a whole bunch of other theorems. From those, you may end up, well, you end up getting this whole structure that is um, a structure where you start off with certain uh, 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 propositions, certain original axioms, and you derive other theorems. And you build this whole network, and this whole network is a multi-way graph, just like there's a uh, just like the multi-way graph that we have in uh, uh, in physics. And you can go and you can look. Um, what is that one? Humph. Let's see. You can look just to sort of connect this with things that one might know about. Um, we can um, uh, we can look at sort of empirical metamathematics. I had looked um, uh, at well, for example, these are. These are um, results in Boolean algebra, um, where you can say what is the the um, the graph, the the um, entailment graph um, that connects these results in Boolean algebra, um, and you will derive all kinds of results. Some of them may be results that are significant that humans talk about. Some of them may just be. Uh, sort of intermediate results that one doesn't particularly talk about. So this is an example. This is the branchial graph of uh, that comes from uh, derivations in Boolean algebra. Just like we can talk about light cones in physics, where you have an event that occurs and it has consequences for other things in the future. So similarly, you can talk about an entailment cone in mathematics, where you say, here's a theorem. What other theorems are entailed in the entailment cone of that theorem? And so you can look at the kind of the transversal uh, to that. You can look at this branchial space that you get, which asks the question, how do you, uh, how, what are the kind of ancestral relations between, between uh, results, between theorems you get? So here are some notable theorems of Boolean algebra, and this shows essentially their, their branchial connections in the entailment cone. Well, we can go through and look at this, um, this is uh, Euclid's elements. This is Euclid's um, uh, the entailments that Euclid, uh, you know, uh, asserted about the theorem. So these are the these are the up here are the propositions and common notions of Euclid, and down here is all the things that Euclid proved. And right down at the bottom is the proof that there are five platonic solids, and that proof in the end has a very complicated. Um, uh, well, you you can see the structure here of, of what leads to that proof. Well, you can do the same kind of thing. You can take, um, uh, yeah, these are this is this is the sort of fully unrolled Euclid proof. Um, you can you can take uh, places where people have tried to make formalized versions of mathematics, uh, things like um, Lean or Coq or, or a system called Metamath, which is a nice, clean, simple system. Um, and uh, you can take the, they've they've encoded you know forty thousand theorems of mathematics together with their proofs, and you can ask the question: How are those things related? And how what is the sort of entailment structure of all those things? And this is the Pythagorean theorem, I think. Yes, this is the Pythagorean theorem in the Mathemath proof uh, assistant system, and uh, you can see. Somewhere down here is the Pythagorean theorem being proved. Somewhere up here are a bunch of axioms of set theory. And this is a complicated mess that goes through uh, 6,970 intermediate theorems to prove the Pythagorean theorem. And you can go through and you can look. I mean, sometimes this is kind of ridiculous. Uh, you can unroll things and you can find out that modus ponens appears 10 to the 36 times in the proof of uh, uh, the Pythagorean theorem. This is sort of a, a sense, uh, and one can even, as I did here, one can even start to compare the sort of number of uh, the number of steps necessary to prove the Pythagorean theorem with the number of elementary events that happen in physics to make something that we experience in the physical world. But you can kind of go on and you can look at, well, all kinds of things. You can look at sort of how, uh, well, this is actually something slightly different, but, but you can look at um, things about how uh, in metamathematical space, in the sort of space of how of things entailing things, how different fields of mathematics are related. Here, for example, are some famous theorems of mathematics and where they lie effectively in this network of, of uh, uh, this sort of axiomatic structure network. Okay, so one question is, is this what mathematics is actually about? This grinding down to these low-level axioms um, and, uh, and, and looking at what happens there. But let me make two comments here. 
Um, one comment is that, uh, well, actually, okay, first comment is, even the level of axioms is not the bottom level. At the level of axioms, as we normally formulate them with kind of variables and quantifiers and things like that, there's already a lot of structure that we put in there. We can actually go down below that level. We can construct those things from something even lower level. We could, for example, use, well, you could, if we were writing this in, in computer code, we could write it in machine code. We could, uh, if we're writing it in a sort of slightly more formal way, we can write, um, uh, let's see, I have an example here. Uh, where is it? Um, Section 22. Thank you. This is what happens when one writes these things too quickly is that, that um, you know, the NKS book, it took a decade to write. This, this particular piece only took about nine months to write. And so I, I don't, uh, uh, I'm not as personally, um, um, the, the, each individual page doesn't, doesn't occupy such a large piece of my, my personal experience. Um, anyway, this is sort of going below the level of um, uh, sort of named variables and things like that. This is using combinators as a basis, by the way, in case people are curious. Combinators, you know, I, I was, it was the 100th anniversary of combinators in, in 2020, in December of 2020. And so I thought I better go actually understand combinators. I've been meaning to really understand this for ages. And I ended up writing this whole book about combinators. Um, but turns out that the effort that I spent on combinators, which might have been thought to be sort of overkill at some level um, in, um, uh, uh, in just studying combinators, combinators are a super useful toy model of lots of kinds of things. And they're really worthwhile as a way to think about sort of the link between sort of meaningful computation and multi-way systems and things like that. So, uh, and by the way, that was the same reason that I, I just studied, I'll just show you that example for a second here. Um, uh, let's see if I can pull it up. Um, just, just for fun, talking about multi-way systems, I just wrote this thing about games and puzzles as multi-way systems. And, you know, here's tic-tac-toe, simplified version of tic-tac-toe as a multi-way graph. And uh, you have somewhere here, I have actual tic-tac-toe. Um, there we go. There's the three by three board. That's the game graph of tic-tac-toe, which is a multi-way graph. And we can start doing the same kind of analysis of it, talking about branch yield graphs, all that kind of thing, as we've done with other uh, with these other systems, this is just a way to kind of humanize um, uh, the phenomenon of multi-computation, humanize this idea of multiple threads of time and so on. Um, and uh, I looked at, needless to say, we looked at all kinds of, well, this is all kinds of things about winning conditions in tic-tac-toe and which side is winning at different places in the multi-way graph and so on. And um, needless to say, we looked at... Uh, Oh, all kinds of other things. Let's see what's, oh yeah, that's that's a fun application of Ramsey theory to, to, to tic-tac-toe. But this is relating it to, to um, uh, things like um, uh, random walks and then mazes and uh, then to um, various kinds of games. That's a game invented by um, uh, William Rowan Hamilton uh, where Hamiltonian circuits came from. That's uh, different, um, anyway, lots of multi-way graphs. But the point here is, is sort of a, a humanization of multi-way graphs um, uh, by, by seeing them sort of in action. There's a the simplified Rubik's cube. There's the multi-way graph you get for that. That's a two by two by two multi uh, Rubik's cube. And that shows it's kind of game graph, another multi-way graph story. Um, so in any case, the, um, uh, but we're now descending below uh, traditional axiom systems, we're looking at them as built from combinators. Um, we can see that we can start making, uh, well, this is arithmetic being built from combinators. Um, uh, and we can cut, start seeing all these different kinds of things built up from combinators. Now, what we realize here is what we have descended to at this point is the Rouliad, basically. We have descended below axiomatic mathematics, and we're at the level of the raw Rouliad, and what we're doing in that raw Rouliad is we're fishing out things and saying that clump of things in the raw Rouliad, we can identify that with the integer one. And then we can identify that other clump with this. And then when we go further up, we say, well, that corresponds to this particular piece of some axiom system. There may be many ways to identify the number one in, in the raw Rouliad. We think of it as being the, the sort of the underlying data structure is a bunch of atoms of existence or EMs which are knitted together by the Rouliad, 
and we're seeing sort of the emergence of the structure of things, of even things like variables, are emerging from these eames um, in, in, at the level of the raw ruliad. So that's kind of going down to the raw ruliad. We've got this kind of, uh, this sort of undefined uh, ocean of, of computations, which we're then sort of identifying pieces of, fishing them out, and saying that looks like a plus sign, so to speak. And we can explicitly see, just for fun, even in empirical metamathematics, we can start to see that phenomenon happen. Um, let's see if I can get to that here. Um, even in these formalized mathematics systems, that is the breakdown of plus in terms of lower level operations of, uh, that ultimately are the things that appear in the axioms of set theory in this particular case logic and set theory. So that's kind of, that's a little bit of the way down. It's not all the way down to the Rouliad, but it's a little bit, it's part of the journey going down, breaking down the definition of plus, that's breaking down the definition of GCD in terms of lower level objects. And what we're doing as we think about the Rouliad is going all the way down, even further, much further down than this, we're reaching the raw Rouliad in the end. And so what we perceive as mathematics is this thing that is some kind of emergent structure um, in the in the raw Rouliad. Okay, let's talk about mathematics as mathematicians actually do it, because most mathematicians do not operate at the level of individual axioms and and uh, at the level of sort of the the grinding detail of, for example, that derivation of. I mean, the Pythagorean theorem. Nobody gives a derivation of the Pythagorean theorem that's based on this kind of stuff. Um, it's uh, with 10 to the 36 uh, instances of modus ponens and things like this. Instead, mathematics as done by humans is done at a much higher level. It's kind of like our perception of fluid dynamics. It's at the fluid level, not at the molecular dynamics level. It's like our perception of the physical universe is at the level of something close to continuum space, not at the level of atoms of space. So somehow, when we think about physics, we as observers of physics are operating at this higher level. How does it work in mathematics? Well, I think it's the same thing. I think that there is a higher level mathematics where we just say it's the Pythagorean theorem. We don't think about, oh, it's based in this kind of representation of the real numbers. It's got this kind of particular definition of this, that, and the other. It's enough to just say it's the Pythagorean theorem. So then what's not obvious, I think I have a picture here of, of the... Um, uh, of the different derivations of you can you can you can reseat the Pythagorean theorem differently even in these axiomatic um, e even in these um, uh, proof assistant systems and so on. Um, I think I had a picture of that. Where is it, James? Where is our beautiful picture go, go, of the Pythagorean go theorem? Go down, wrong way. Further down. Yeah. Uh, Ah, there it is. Okay. Yeah. These are two different formulations of the Pythagorean theorem derived from, from the same axioms, but they're sort of, they're, these are, but for a mathematician, it's like, it's just the Pythagorean theorem. Yes, there are differences. If you grind down to the level of atoms of existence, these can be very, very, very different. But at the level of the way mathematicians think about it, one thinks about them as the same thing. Okay. So the question is, does that work? And it's like saying, can you do fluid mechanics? Or do you have to go down to the level of molecular dynamics? There are effects when you're studying hypersonic flow or something where you have no choice but to go down to the level of, of underlying, uh, of the sort of underlying molecules. But most of the time, it's enough to just think about things at the fluid dynamics level. So the claim is that what we're making is that essentially, the fact that higher level mathematics is possible, the fact that you can consistently just think about the Pythagorean theorem, not this ground down thing in terms of atoms of existence, that is the same basic phenomenon as the phenomenon that allows us to think about continuum space. And it happens because it's observers like us that are doing the mathematics. Now, it turns out that the way we think about how we sort of are, are extracting things from the Rouliad is different the way we coordinateize the Rouliad for mathematics and for physics is different. Physics is a very time-oriented coordination of the Rouliad. Mathematics is much more of a of a kind of a, a transverse uh, way of thinking about the Rouliad. We think about entailment fabrics. We think about the mathematical observer kind of building up this kind of zone of of the Rouliad that is their sort of the the set of things that they think of as being. The sort of the, the 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 things they think are true in their mathematics, so to speak, and and we kind of think about uh, moving from there 
and and deriving other kinds of things. So, for example, here's, here's an example of a, of something. If you think about the notion of falsity in mathematics, remember the things we're doing here are deeply constructive. We're saying you just derive this theorem from this theorem from this theorem. So, what happens? What is falsity? Well, falsity, and this is something people have talked about since the Middle Ages, the principle of explosion. The idea that once you have something which is false, you can derive everything. And so in our picture, what that is, is something where you, you have, it's like a white hole in physics. It's something where it's just sort of spewing out um, results. Now for an observer, the issue is that a computationally bounded observer can't deal with that. The computationally bounded observer is trying to have this coherent view of what's going on, this, this bounded region of rural space that the observer kind of uh, has, in, has in their mind as being what they think is true in mathematics. And as soon as you introduce this exploding sort of uh, false proposition, that is no longer possible. You can no longer maintain that kind of coherence. So in any case, the, the, the sort of the, the, the idea here is to think about uh, mathematics as something which emerges from the Rouliad. There's a notion of metamathematical space, which has all these theorems embedded in it and, and connected in uh, different distances in, in metamathematical space and so on. And there's this notion of the observer um, who is uh, essentially deciding, you know, to take a particular sampling of the Rouliad. Now, uh, so what, what are some predictions of this kind of approach? So one important thing is, one of the things about physics that is not obvious at all is that there are laws of physics. That is, it might be the case that you're stuck talking about individual things about individual atoms of space and so on, and there won't be any zoomed out laws of physics. There won't be anything like general relativity, anything like that. It's all details, so to speak. But we know there are actually laws of physics, global laws of physics. So the question is, are there global laws of mathematics? If we have this picture that mathematics also emerges from the Rouliad, what are the global laws of mathematics? Here's an example. So imagine that uh, in, in physical space, there's a certain homogeneity to the universe. The universe here is pretty much the same as the universe somewhere else, as far as many aspects of the structure of space time and other things are concerned. What would that be like in mathematics? That's like saying one place in metamathematical space is much like another place in mathematical metamathematical space. What that means is if you take some structure that you've built in one part of metamathematical space, you can transport it to another part of metamathematical space. What that's like, I mean, you can think about it category theory with functors and things like that, but you can also think about it as just sort of the, the statement that you have one area of mathematics and there will be some duality to another area of mathematics. It's kind of explaining to you the, the homogeneity of metamathematical space is kind of the statement that there will be sort of that, that the, the structure of one area of mathematics will have a correspondence after some translation that corresponds to metamathematical motion to another area of mathematics. So that's kind of the, the type of thing that you would conclude from thinking about things in terms of metamathematical, uh, in, in terms of this kind of Rouliad structure of mathematics. Another thing not yet fully worked out is the idea that what is the analog of a black hole, for example? What's the analog of energy in mathematical space? Presumably proof density. What's the analog of a black hole? Presumably, so you know, one characteristic of black holes, these space-like singularities, is that time ends. So in our models, usually you're just getting to update the network, but you can be in a situation where there is no update that applies. So in a sense, time has ended in that place. And, and that's uh, and that's the interpretation of of a space like singularity in our models. And so the question then is, well, what about um, uh, what about the um, uh, what, what's the analog of that in metamathematical space? What's a black hole in metamathematical space? Well, the picture of that is it's it's kind of like a decidable theory where essentially in in a in an ordinary undecidable theory uh, where you know Gödel's theorem applies and all this kind of thing there are proofs of arbitrarily long lengths and of unbounded lengths. And that's like saying there are paths you can take and you just never, time never stops. Time just keeps going. You keep wandering around further and further. But in the case where you're in, a, in, a, um, in, the, in this black hole setting, the, you, know, you have these GD6 of, of limited length, 
and the analog of that is you have proofs of limited length and the details aren't aren't quite nailed down here but the basic picture is the sort of proofs of bounded length are the ones that show up in decidable theories and so what you might think is there's something like singularity theorems of physics that say when there are enough proofs around you will inevitably end up with a decidable theory and so one question that you might ask is what's the long term future of mathematics what what will it look like it, you know when we propagate mathematics forwards and so on what will the result be and kind of one amusing thing is that we think about you know in physics we might think about well uh, you know all the matter is going to just aggregate into a bunch of black holes and so on in mathematics you're saying well all the mathematics is going to aggregate into a bunch of decidable theories and so that's kind of the the sort of the common future of physics and mathematics now i mean there's there's lots of things to say slightly more philosophically about um about the structure of um uh, what you what you get from thinking about kind of the mathematical observer the physical observer and the correspondence between those there are you know things about platonism and so on and the fact that if you believe that the universe exists the physical universe exists uh, that is sort of our interpretation of our sampling of the Rouliad. The Rouliad necessarily exists. We are, uh, we, uh, the, our, our existence is, is the result of, uh, uh, we think about that in terms of sampling the Rouliad. We can then come up with a conclusion that in the same sense that the physical universe exists, so also there's ultimately something underneath mathematics that similarly exists. Lots of, lots of kinds of consequences like that. Let me let me paint one more picture and then then we should uh, wrap up for now, which is OK. So, oh, oh, by the way, I mean, one of the things is in doing empirical metamathematics, there's a lot to be done in empirical metamathematics. One of the more bizarre things that may be true is that it may be easier to get evidence of our theories in mathematics than in physics. That is, by doing empirical metamathematics, you can discover features of the sort of the mathematical, the structure of mathematical space and so on. You can discover things like, oh, there is this necessary, uh, you know, you can observe these things like the homogeneity of mathematical space and so on. You might expect to be able to do that empirically in, in, in mathematics. And I think the, um, so that, uh, uh, I, I mean, I should explain that meta, empirical metamathematics done from human mathematical databases is the same thing as doing geography rather than geodesy. That is, you know, you got the, the surface of the earth and we know where all the cities are. And that's the human geography of the earth. That's where humans chose to populate on the earth. And so similarly in mathematics, the theorems that are in textbooks, there are a few million of those, um, are the places that humans chose to put little pins in, in, in all possible mathematical space. And, and so, uh, what we might conclude, if we know where all those pins are, and we, we knew that for geography for the Earth, then what we would conclude is that, um, uh, you know, by golly, we notice that, well, all of these places where humans have populated on the Earth, they all lie on the surface of a sphere. And, and so that, you know, from the geography, we can conclude something about the geodesy, basically. And so similarly, I think that's the way that we imagine concluding things in empirical metamathematics, at least that's one approach to empirical metamathematics, is to be able to see from what has been populated what the underlying structure has to be. We can also look at the at the pure underlying structure. One of the challenges there is just that these entailment cones get very big. And um, they're sort of the, the, just like in physics, we have the same problem going from the atoms of space to something we can actually observe in a physical experiment of human scale is difficult. Similarly, going from the, the, uh, the sort of raw entailment cones to something we can observe in, in sort of the mathematics that humans care about is difficult. It's not quite as difficult in mathematics because we have this intermediate assembly language level. We're not quite at the machine code level because we have this axiomatic layer that isn't quite the same as something that we have in physics. And so we're not going from the raw eames, the raw Rouliad up. We've got a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit of a, a boost there. Okay, so so let me just outline a couple of other things. I, I think um, uh, the um, uh, one of the points here is so there's this whole kind of way of thinking about physics, way of thinking about mathematics. In a sense, one of the core ideas here is this idea of multi-computation. There's several core ideas. I mean, there's a kind of a core idea of ruleology, of studying the space of possible rules, 
there's the core idea of meta modeling of being able to take kind of things that have been studied as models of things and ask what the essence of those things is but then there's this idea of multi computation this idea of many threads of time this idea that kind of goes beyond the paradigm of computation. I mean, I mentioned these sort of three paradigms from the structural to the mathematical to the computational. And in the computational paradigm, it's just like you take these rules and then you evolve them forwards and you see you go from one state of the system to another, to another, to another, and so on. But uh, you can always observe the what the the in that model it's just like there's a definite state of the system in the multi computational setup you've got all these different threads of time and there's no way to to make any sense of that without sampling across many threads of time without having a notion of an observer and so this idea of multi computation is something which necessarily involves the observer it has many threads of time and it has to be those those have to be uh, that there has to be some coherence that's generated by the observer. And, and so one of the things we've been very interested in is this notion of observer theory, the question of can we make a, a sort of a, a, a meta model of the observer, a little bit like Turing machines are a meta model of computation. Um, and so uh, various kinds of thinking about that, one of the projects I've been interested in recently is kind of inventorying all the different ways one measures things. You know, in, in Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Language, we have about 10,000 kinds of units, and we have a, about a thousand, we've sort of curated about a thousand different kinds of measuring devices. And so those are different ways you can measure things. And the question is, what's the bigger picture? What's the, what's the meta thing that's like computation? That's what's the meta thing about observation? It's kind of like you have a bunch of molecules that are bouncing around and they all hit some paddle that, that they push a little bit, and that's how you measure pressure. How do we think about that in a general way? And how do we characterize I, I, how do we characterize the observer? Or more to the point, how do we characterize observers like us? How do we characterize, how do we make a meta model for those aspects of observation that are the ones that we humans in the current stage of technology have been involved with? Uh, in a sense, there is a more absolute notion of what is out there to measure, it's the whole Rouliad. And, and one of the more bizarre sort of philosophical points here is that we are now a sort of, we sample the Rouliad in these tiny, tiny little uh, uh, sort of slices of the Rouliad of what we're sampling. And we, we are able to, we, in our minds, we can keep coherence in our minds because we're sampling just these tiny slices of the Rouliad. As we kind of evolve to, to sample bigger, swaths of the Rouliad, it becomes more and more difficult for us to have sort of a coherent notion of what's going on. So our existence and our kind of experience and mind likeness and so on is a consequence of the fact that we're actually sampling only these tiny pieces of the Rouliad. And in a sense, as we think about, well, what's the future of, you know, technology and, and, uh, and intellectual development and so on, we say, well, we're going to expand out, we're going to, we're going to colonize the whole Rouliad. The problem with doing that is, by the time you've spread out to the whole Rouliad, you kind of don't really exist as a coherent entity anymore. Um, so it's kind of a, a disappointing, you know, uh, be careful what you wish for kind of thing. But in any case, the, the, um, uh, this, this notion of multi-computation, this notion where observers matter, we have to try and develop an observer theory, this idea of multi-computation applies to a whole bunch of other fields. And we've started to look at them, and I'll uh, just list off a few of them. I might talk about these a little bit more uh, maybe next next week um, when we have uh, 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 other people also 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 here. Um, the um, uh, but just to just to sort of rattle off a few of the different areas. So you know, after physics, meta mathematics was the first one we looked at. Uh, another one, uh, um, you know, we are hot on the trail of is chemistry. Um, when you think about a chemical reaction, you're thinking about um, the, the you think about chemical synthesis, for example, it's another multi-way system story of you can make these different moves from this chemical, you can you can do this, you can do that. But as you go down to the lowest level, to the kind of uh, emish level, you're looking at individual molecules and their interactions. And so we kind of suspect that there are probably aspects of what is essentially the multi-way graph of all interactions where when we do ordinary chemistry, all we look at is the total concentration of each molecule, but there's more in the multi-way graph than that. Um, and uh, uh, ironically, 
we're not really even talking about quantum chemistry here. We're talking about ordinary chemistry just with, with classical molecules, but yet the formalism that we'll use is a formalism that is deeply coming from quantum mechanics, even though there's nothing really quantum about it. But then the, the, the idea it has to do with looking at, again, I'll talk about this in more detail another time, um, is, uh, is to look at kind of the choreography of molecules that goes beyond just how much of each kind of chemical there is. And it is my suspicion that, uh, that it is a key thing that's been missed in molecular biology is the importance of the choreography of molecules, so to speak. And that it's kind of like when, when you know, DNA and the idea of digital genetic information was, was discovered in the 1950s, um, that was kind of a thing that opened up a bunch of thinking about biology. I kind of have a suspicion that there's the possibility of a similar kind of thing using this kind of multi-computational paradigm to think about sort of the full details of what happens with molecules beyond just the how much of this kind of chemical species is there. Well, related to that is how you do molecular computing. And one of the things that um, I think is, is true is, and one of the general things we're looking at is, what's, what is multi-computation? You know, in ordinary computation, you feed in an input. It's like typical Wolfram language workflow. You feed in an input, it goes crunch, 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 and you get an output. Now, in multi-computation, that's not what happens. In multi-computation, you get this whole multi-way graph. Now, one of the things, and, and I, I really realized only very recently how exceptionally lucky I was back in 1979 when I was first developing this idea of transformation rules on symbolic expressions, because I, I realized at the time, I knew perfectly well at the time, that when you do transformations on symbolic expressions, there are many possible transformations you can do. But I thought, well, let me just do the simplest thing. Let me do the you know, leftmost, innermost trans transformations, and let me just keep running them until I get to a fixed point. Okay, And that's what Wolfram Language does. That's what the evaluator of Wolfram Language, that's what it does. It, it, it runs, it does transformations, it keeps going, it chooses particular transformations to do, and it keeps going until there are no more transformations to be done. Turns out doing that is really useful. Turns out that's what lets us do all the computation we do in Wolfram Language, um, and that was enough. That's the humanly useful computation. But in a sense, there's a multi-computational version of Wolfram Language where instead of following just that one path, you follow all possible paths. I actually tried to do something a little bit like that, parameterizing different paths back in 1980 or so, 1981. And the problem was I didn't really understand it and nobody else understood it. And so this is sort of a challenge for right now. Can we make a multi-computational version of Wolfram Language? But one of the big issues there is what's an answer in multi-computation? Because an answer depends on the observer. And by the way, logic programming, probabilistic programming, these are all different instances of different ways you sample the answer from a multi-way graph. So in any case, the, the, um, so, so another project we have, uh, Nick is particularly concerned with this one, um, is uh, practical multi-computation in Wolfram language. And, uh, and what are the analogs of functional programming for multi-computation? But one of the reasons that's important is because I think for molecular computing, whatever, that, whatever the answer to that is, that's what we get to use in molecular computing because in molecular computing, it's again, we've got all these molecules going around and we, we have to have an observer who is sampling them in a particular way. And we have to know what, how do you deduce the answer from that sampling? So that's another case. So back to biology, a uh, recent thing I've been thinking about is uh, biological evolution and um, using, well, the question is how much of biological evolution is essentially kinematic? That is, does it not really depend on the, on the detailed dynamics of things? Is it just a consequence of structure? And so what you imagine is, imagine the genealogical graph of all organisms that have ever lived. So, you know, usually when people do biology, they don't think about anything like that. That's a way too small scale of thing. But just imagine, I don't know, I, 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 I'm trying to remember, I know I did an estimate of how many organisms have ever lived, and I thought it was in the NKS book, and I can't find it. But I, I'm, maybe it's 10 to the 40th organisms, I'm not sure. But you can imagine a genealogical graph of all of those organisms. And somehow that graph is colored by, well, this is the clump that corresponds to this species, that's the clump that corresponds to that species, and so on. And you can imagine that just like there's the branchial distance in that genealogical graph, 
is the literally ancestral distance. That's essentially how related, you know, is it the is it the, the, the 15th cousin seven times removed or something? That's essentially distance in branch hill space is telling you that degree of genealogical relation. And similarly, one can think about in, in biology, one thinks about also spatial position. And just like in the physics project, there's a branchial position, there's a spatial position. There's also, I don't quite know what the analog of this is in the physics project, there's trophic levels, like things eat things. Um, and that, has, that also has some consequence for this graph. So in any case, the, the, those are all uh, sort of pieces of, of this picture. And the question is, what can you deduce globally about biological evolution from thinking about that limit of that graph? So there are just a whole bunch of other ones of these. I mean, there's economics is another area we've been looking at. That kind of started with trying to use the physics project to make a practical version of distributed blockchain, a sort of more distributed version of blockchain where there's not just a single ledger that you're building up. And that kind of led to the question of, well, how does economics really work fundamentally? What, what is the emergence of, of value in economics? You know, the elementary events of these elementary transactions, how do the elementary transactions get knitted together into the thing that's like kind of continuum space where there's a definite notion of price and so on. And that's the thing James and I have been particularly, James has been working on um, and uh, of, of how, that, how that might work and whether there is, uh, what, we, what we then wonder about is what is the economic observer like? And one of the things that might be true about economics is that the things that might be the obvious things that a human observer economic actor is interested in turn out not to be the things about which there is a theory. So, you know, there might be a generic general relativity like theory for the underlying sort of Rouliad like structure of economics, but that might or might not be the thing that you can trade on with a, in a hedge fund or something. Um, it's uh, so that, that's that's another area. There are also applications to uh, machine learning. Uh, there are also applications to linguistics. And what am I forgetting? Uh, I don't know. That 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 seems like enough. Um, the uh, uh, the basic point is just like the computational paradigm gave us this new raw material for making models of things, so the multi-computational paradigm is again giving us new raw material for making models of things. The big difference though, is that while the computational paradigm, computational irreducibility is its great big sort of phenomenon, and computational irreducibility is a limitation on predictability, in multi-computation, because of the interaction with observers, we again have the possibility of having things like the laws of physics that are kind of simplified narrative statements about what happens. So anyway, that, that, that's, um, that's a little bit of, of outline of, of, of things. And, and one of the things that's been really, really wonderful is that as we make progress, even in thinking about, thinking about metamathematics, from the thinking about that, we understand physics better. From the thinking about uh, like uh, multi-computation as a practical matter, we understand things in mathematics and physics better and vice versa. Uh, you know, we understand things about multi-computational programming better from physics and so on. And it's really a, a lovely thing that this kind of one idea of multi-computation is knitting together all these different areas because there's this kind of common underlying formalism. And that that's sort of a, a, another wonderful feature of this. Anyway, so that's a very, very quick survey of, of some of uh, where we're at with some things. And um, I'm kind of looking forward to uh, uh, these summer schools, you know, the, the whole physics project got launched at the 2019 summer school. So I'm, I'm almost a little bit afraid of what could get launched because the physics project is already big enough. Um, and by the time it adds in metamathematics and all of multi-computation, it's already pretty big. So, so uh, I, you know, it's, um, it's, it's maybe, um, uh, but, um, uh, it will be interesting to see what we um, uh, what we managed to launch um, uh, in, in this in this year, um, and I think, um, as I say, I, I I fully expect there's just an awful lot of low hanging fruit, and it's been you know there's a slow and steady process of beginning to pick some of it, and uh, uh, there's a lot more to pick. I think you know the time scales where we're sort of right you know we're in that five to ten year period when sort of the, the most low hanging fruit is there. I have to say that these, these areas, this is deep and complicated stuff. And it is also technically complicated. And like, if you look at the history of general relativity, it went from 1915 to the 1960s to untangle the technicalities of what had to be done. 
um, even before you started getting sort of more of the the, the real traction on on um, uh, exciting effects and so on. Um, and I think I, I'm hoping that we can accelerate that. Uh, I mean, I think it, it really helps that in a sense, the methodology we're using is this combination of in, in training all of the methodology from math mathematical from mathematical physics and things like that. Plus, we have two other kinds of methodology. One critical methodology is, is practical computation. The fact that you know the physics project would have been absolutely impossible if we hadn't been able to simulate things and see what was actually happening. Because all the time, the things you actually see are not what you expect to see. I mean, my, my statement about that is the computational animals are always smarter than we are, so to speak. It, that you always see things when you actually do experiments that are things you didn't expect and wouldn't have predicted. So that's very important. The other thing that has increasingly emerged is kind of this philosophical approach to thinking about things is, is very, very powerful and useful. And I think one of the things I've noticed in recent times, okay, that's a bit of a knock on, on um, uh, you know, there tends to be, a, a, among many scientists, there's a thought that uh, all thought is incremental and that, that when, when you do a project or something that, or you, when you are confronted with a new idea, that somehow it can only be epsilon away from something you already know. And so there has to be just this one step and I've noticed that people who are a good sort of uh, professional philosophers, for example, they're kind of used to the fact that there can be multiple steps that you have to take to get to an idea. And I think one of the things that's happened in this project is we're realizing there's actually some philosophically quite complicated ideas that you need to, you need to sort of wrap your brain around. Um, and once you understand those things, a lot of stuff becomes kind of intuitive and obvious, but it's important to do that. And it's not sort of a pure, uh, and, and the, the very fact that one even thinks about doing that is important for kind of really being able to make progress in the project. So it's kind of a funny thing where we've got this kind of, uh, you know, we've got the philosophy and we've got the computation and those are sort of at opposite ends. The philosophy is kind of very, in a sense, qualitative and conceptual. The computation is very much how do the bits actually work? And somewhere in the middle is all of the stuff that comes from existing mathematical physics and so on, and, and from existing pure mathematics. And so I think that's a it's a pretty powerful combination, and it's one that's worth sort of bearing in mind as you try and learn about the stuff that there is. It's it's a little different in texture, in a sense, from what one learns about in typical technical areas of science.